nowadays, trained through various techniques, we are taught to essentially, repeatedly, listen or see infamous liars as, quote, authorities or experts. The place to go for control of information. So you'll have individuals or groups, mainly groups, which are outed many times over and over and over again who have a history of lying and other sorts of activities, but specifically lying. They're infamous. Yet somehow they continue to have an air of truthfulness despite the fact that they are known liars. Usually, in normal circumstances, a person will lie and thus nothing can be trusted because there's no real way to know whether or not they continue lying. That is the idea of having uh, a bad reputation, right? Or a reputation for lying, essentially. That's pretty common today. That's sort of what's taught in the school system. I mean, a basic uh, example of that would be somebody who is lying in order to spare feelings. That's very common. But if you'll do that, then, you know, you'll lie about anything to determine, depending on the reason, right? You can rationalize a reason for it. But these people, across the board, are known to be liars, and yet they continue to be recognized and to be listened to by a large number of people, which naturally leads to many problems. And then this problem might be identified, but then those people go right back, just like a dog returning to its vomit. Now, this is done in a variety of different ways. However, we're not going to look at that today. What we're going to look at specifically in this video is the market manipulation. So market manipulation has to do with the mainly the control of access to selling. It doesn't technically speaking have to do with the I mean, it does have to do with the actual selling of it, but in order to instigate or institute a market manipulation, you control the access to the ability for selling. So the market, right? A marketplace being an area that individuals go to or groups to sell wares, to sell services or to sell goods, right? You control the access point, you control the market, thus you control everything related to it. Most of the time, we understand today as we're taught that marketing refers to somebody's ability to promote or advertise their products. So these are completely diametrically opposed concepts, the idea of going to market versus being a marketer or market team. And naturally, most of the marketers that are involved in large companies are nothing but glorified pamphleteers who just go around regurgitating endless and mundane propaganda for uh, corporate uh, propaganda purposes. So in this context, we are going to look at the foundational subject of a market and naturally how it is manipulated, starting with the labels that they impose upon the market. First, we have the white market of which you only have, you have very little written about white market, as far as I can tell, where it states in, uh, it's a noun in economics, the legal official, by the way, legal means in writing, official means of an office or intended market. Intended, well, whose intention, right? For goods and services. Yeah, basically what I said, sale of goods and services. Distinguished from the black market and gray market. So that's not very much to go on right there at all. It's particularly vague and none of the, it's using jargony words which are being used in a certain way but they actually mean other things as well. And that's the typical run of course. So a white market, right? The idea of white being good or pure, naturally the color white is used generally for weddings and things like that, although when it comes to other cultures, apparently it represents death. So there's a interesting confl conflict there. And also white, you know, the creativity, the white of a canvas, a blank canvas, white of paper, etc. 
so white has a bunch of connotations to it. Now, I expect that you could probably use the colors in a, a traffic light to represent the same thing. Green means go, yellow means uh, slow down, and then of course red means stop. So here we've got white, gray, and black being used in the same manner. It's a uh, training behavior based off of color labels. So the gray market is a noun, and this has a little bit more written about it than the white. It states business, the buying and selling of goods through distribution channels other than those authorized or intended by the manufacturer or producer. So if you go outside the mode of operation by manufacturer or producer, then that puts you in the gray market, according to this. So logically speaking, you could be in both the white and gray market because if the white, well, according to the definition of white market, you could be in both at the same time, gray and white. But that's what happens when you have vague definitions. Anyway, to finance the trading of shares before they're listed on the stock exchange. Now that might pertain to the particular stock exchange that we're all aware of in New York City, which is fake, right? They it's a it's a Ponzi scheme, it's a scam. They run fake numbers and sell fake numbers of fake products that don't exist. Basically, it's all set up on fraud. And once that fraud's realized, it gets understood that the value isn't there and then people try to pull out everything that they can and that's all actual value that's put into it uh you know they don't get their money back and thus you have a quote-unquote stock market crash which then requires an intervention to keep it afloat as happened in the 1930s and many other times as well and will happen again of course but I'm, this time on a much larger scale when you have things that are based continuously over repeated fraud or when somebody borrows multiple times using the same collateral and then all of those creditors call on that collateral, well, you don't have enough collateral to pay all of them because you use the same collateral for multiple uh, debts and thus the default on debts cause you know other problems and so on and so forth. That's how a lot of these systems are set up. But they could be talking about a different stock exchange. They could actually be talking about a stock exchange which is uh, commodities or exchange of, of actual tangible things of value not the one in New York so they don't really it doesn't say the one in New York right but you have to assume that it is considering the manner of uh, speech and the way that things are written today naturally there's a lot more written about the quote-unquote black market which is your red color on the traffic lights, it's a don't do this, this is bad, we deem it so because we have labeled it as black, bad color, evil, don't do it, right? And here they got all the different fun little labels and words that they apportion to it to give it an emotional stigma, as it's used one of their words that they love to use a lot, probably incorrectly, who knows, or just one aspect, stigma. But either way, this is not exactly, um, it doesn't explain it very well, just like the other ones. It just has a lot more words attached to it, right? Anyway, uh, Wikipedia again. It states a black market or underground economy. Underground. That's a metaphorical underground because most of the time, as far as I'm aware, black markets don't have to be subterranean right <laughs> not all done in subways or in some sort of uh, subterranean structure as underground would be or shadow economy so naturally in this sense black underground and shadow is a clandestine market or a series of transactions that has some aspect of illegality so some aspect of not being in writing is how that would actually be termed, or is not compliant with an institutional set of rules. And here's their little game here. Is not compliant with an institutional set of rules. So if it is in compliance with any institutional set of rules, then it's not black market, right? But it has some aspect of illegality, some aspect of not being in writing. 
That is an impossibility. It's either in writing or it's not. It cannot have an aspect of it being in writing. Quite ridiculous. Well, I suppose you could have a part that's in writing and then a part that's not. But if we get into that sort of hair splitting, then that, that's just a whole other nightmare because technically speaking, everything is either partially is is partially written because you can't have everything done in writing. If everything was done in writing, then it wouldn't be in reality, right? There's a portion that is going to happen in reality, but that's all for another time. If the rule defines a set of goods and services whose production and distribution is prohibited or restricted by law. There's another thing they do. Which law, right? There are many laws. Any law at all suffices. That's how they, they do their little word games a lot. Non-compliance with the rule constitutes a black market trade since the transaction itself is illegal. And so here they're stating illegal is non-compliance with the rule. Well, which rule, right? It's obviously their rule. This is being written from one perspective. But it is important to understand how they do the controls based off training behavior using colors, just like with a child, and labeling, right? Labeling. Bad, sort of, all right, good. Bad, middle, good. Right? They do that with, this with everything and thus they can manipulate markets, usually for detrimental outcomes as we see today. Such transactions include the illegal drug trade, and there you go. Include, doesn't have to be illegal drug trade, so not written drug trade without prescription essentially, because a legal drug trade is a prescription drug trade. Prescription being, well, pre is actually before apparently, um, but description being, of course, a writing. Prostitution, where prohibited. So if it's not prohibited, it's not black market, right? It is all, all of this has to do with control. It doesn't have to do with the act itself or the damage of that act. It entirely, completely has to do with arbitrary control. It is bad if they don't control it, and thus it is black. That's the color they put on it. Illegal currency transactions and human trafficking. And these, of course, include transactions in it. But as we've seen today, you can have a black market egg trade. I'm not using egg as a code word. I'm talking about the real egg that comes from a chicken, generally. Chicken eggs or possibly duck eggs, either way. Any sort of egg that you consume for food physically that's not made out of human beings or any of the nonsense, right? No little code words there. That coming from a farm usually or some other free range or whatever nonsense while those have become black market objects and items because egg smuggling was apparently a huge thing or has become a huge thing because of uh, um, high prices on eggs of course there's also meat right you know meat smuggling so, yes, you can have a lot of other transactions, but they always add these things to it. Illegal drug trade, prostitution, illegal currency transactions, and human trafficking. See, it has absolutely nothing to do with the damage of those things. It has entirely to do with the control of those things. If it's a legal drug trade, it's fine. If it's legal prostitution, it's fine. If it's legal currency transactions, which, of course, means legal counterfeit currency transaction, it's fine. And if it's legal human trafficking, it's fine. That is the operative the concept here. Participants try to hide their legal behavior from the government or regulatory authority. Cash is the preferred medium of exchange in illegal transactions, since cash transactions are less easily traced. Less easily. This is written by an idiot that doesn't know proper grammar, or more than likely, this is taken from an extorted assignment from some poor student who is being exploited for free, free labor in the uh, education system. Common motives for operating in black markets are to trade contraband, avoid taxes and regulations, and evade price controls or rationing. All has to do with control, taxes, and regulations. 
but are not really taxes. Typically, the totality of such activity is referred to with a definite article, the black market in bush meat. The black market is distinct from the gray market in which commodities are distributed through channels that, while illegal, are unofficial, unauthorized, or unintended by the original manufacturer, and the white market in which trade is legal and official. Official, again, meaning office, legal, meaning written. Black money is the proceeds of an illegal transaction on which income and other taxes have not been paid and which can only be legitimized by some form of money laundering because of the clandestine nature of the black market it is not possible to determine its size and scope. Black money, right? So there they go. It's a bad black. All right, gray, good white. You know, green go, yellow, uh, slow down, red, stop. Pretty stupid stuff. Anyway, uh, the main thing that it has to do with is what they, the extortion money, they call taxes and naturally price control, so market manipulation. Now, there's a section in the Constitution, which is illegitimate, illegitimate by the way, called the 16th Amendment, which states that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states without regard to any census or enumeration. Now, this is specifically written this way because it is directly contrary to other parts of the Constitution and therefore illegitimate and fraudulent. Now, this is obviously imposed because income does not specifically have to do with wages. Most of us are taught from our slavely low, you know, middle or lower class position, according to their nonsense, that an income is our wage, but an income means anything that is coming in, anything at all that is coming in. So this is where you get the idea of inheritance taxes. This is where you get the idea of land taxes, so what we would call property tax. However, property tax also governs other forms of private property. So what they're doing is they're not technically speaking derive, depriving people of their property without due process. They're simply imposing a tax upon people's property, which they then will take without due process because the, if somebody refuses to pay their fraudulent tax on income, anything that comes into your possession, well, then they will take it which that's where you get into deprivation of property without due process of law. However, this particular amendment right here, which from the 12th and onward are all fraudulent and illegitimate, we find it's stating that it's giving Congress the ability to lay and collect taxes on incomes, right? From whatever source derived. However, it specifically states with apportionment among the several states without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration because those are the specific wordings prohibiting this activity in earlier parts of the Constitution. The main portion of the Constitution that prohibits this type of behavior it states no capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. The 16th Amendment is directly in writing contradicting this section and it's doing it aggressively and intentionally on purpose. It was written like that to be combative because it was written by enemies enemies to the Constitution. And that's, of course, enemies to anybody who takes an oath of allegiance to the United States Constitution, such as the armed forces. However, this is not the only section that that particular part states. Now, that amendment, the 16th Amendment, is the main basis for market manipulation, which we didn't have under the Constitution. We did not have market manipulation, especially not in the context that we see it today with price controls and so-called fake taxes. So let's go ahead and look at the other sections of the Constitution that this is violating. Here we have the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. In the Ninth, it states the enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, which is what the Sixteenth Amendment is doing. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Thus, we have the 16th Amendment, which 
the main design is to counter and contradict, counteract all intentions and everything made in the Constitution, especially as far as it comes to market controls and phony taxes. But it is delegating to the United States by the Constitution something that was specifically prohibited to the United States, the Constitution. That's, it is essentially a violation of of the Tenth Amendment because it was prohibited, and then they unprohibited it by adding a fraudulent amendment. So, there you go. So, it states, Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years. There is your enumerated taxation, and that is the only direct tax or capitation. Thus, the 16th Amendment is illegitimate, and it is the basis for the current phony market manipulation scheme that we have today that people follow because they're taught white, gray, and black as bad, as good, bad, good, middle, and bad colors for markets. And excluding Indians not taxed. Of course, all Indians are taxed today. Three-fifths of all other persons. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of ten years. In such manner as they shall by law direct. Now they're, of course, talking about constitutional law, not any nonsensical phony enemy law that is derived up in Switzerland or the Vatican or any other part that is foreign to a, a entity for now you can have domestic entities such as the Catholic Church in the United States, the Order of the Jesuits, the uh, Odd Fellows, uh, various uh, Masonic uh, subsects, and all that stuff. You can have all these organizations. They might be domestic, but they're contrary to the Constitution and enemies of it, and they will enact and direct their own laws, which are contrary uh, to the Constitution. And those are not the laws that this is talking about because it says shall by law direct, but it's not saying any law. They always play this game where they state it's law, but it's not the constitutional law. It's a different law, you know. It's international law or whatnot. The number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000, but each state shall have at least one representative, and until such enumeration shall be made, the state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose three, blah, blah, blah. Now, there are many other ways other than price controls to institute market manipulation and to essentially... Uh, manipulate other sections and the entire financial system as a whole, right? There, there's there's a lot more that it comes down to than just market manipulation. Market manipulation, of course, is a very important component, but there are other uh, sections of manipulations and controls as well. Now, prohibition is a primary example of a highly invasive crime that is so far overrepresented as its impact goes. Uh, that it's it's mainly a lie about how impactful it was, and prohibition, as far as we see it today, is still going on today, right? Um, the idea of prohibition prohibition of activities and certain things that's still going on. We still have prohibition in many different areas. Things being prohibited to the people in general. By individuals who have no authority and are in fact prohibited by the Constitution from doing what they're doing, but they do it anyway because nobody holds them accountable because currently we don't have any constitutional enforcement to uh, put to trial and then correctly uh, address and fix these problems. Anyway, according to Wikipedia, again, uh, more line from this, uh, you know, phony government-controlled entity. Prohibition era was the period from 1920 to 1933 when the United States prohibited the production, importation, transportation, sale of alcoholic beverages. The alcohol industry was curtailed by se succession of state legislatures and finally ended nationwide under the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution, ratified on January 16, 1919. Of course, that is a fraudulent amendment, just like anything that came after the 12th. Well, and the 12th. Anything that came after the 11th, I believe, because the 12th Amendment was fraudulent. Everything subsequently after the 12th, also. Prohibition ended with the ratification of the 21st Amendment, which repealed the 18th Amendment on December 5th, 1933. And that's not how the amendments work. You cannot just add one and repeal it. You can write into it things like that. But they add amendments into the Constitution that can't contradict and counteract uh, articles in the Constitution, which 
are not amendments, but and they also do it through a bunch of bogus and fraudulent ways. Anyway, led by pietistic Protestants, prohibitionists first attempt to end the trade in alcoholic drinks during the 19th century. They aim to heal what they saw as an ill society based by alcohol-related problems such as alcoholism, family violence, and saloon-based political corruption. Here's your explaining intentions of people that did stuff in the past when, in fact, their intentions were to wreak foreign enemy operations of warfare to damage and undermine and destroy the supreme law of the land. That's what all this stuff was about. And still is. Impose foreign uh, rule and control. Many communities introduced alcohol bans in the late 19th through 20th centuries, and enforcement of these new prohibitions laws became a topic of debate. Prohibition's supporter called Dries presented it as a battle for public morals and health. The movement was taken up by progressives in the Prohibition Democratic and Republican parties. Uh, and uh, as far as I'm aware, the Democrat Republican Party was originally a singular party. So this is definitely written by some college student from recent times who is uh, simply carrying out a mandated assignment and not realizing their stuff is going to be stuck as articles on Wikipedia. And gained a national grassroots base through the Women's Christian Temperance Union. After 1900, it was coordinated by the Anti-Saloon League, opposition from the beer industry, mode, blah, blah, blah. And so this is just going to have a bunch of uh, labels and other nonsense. Either way, we get an understanding of what this is and how they present it. Prohibition, according to them, specifically only has to do with alcohol. And, of course, prohibition isn't around because now they have direct and portioned in, uh, non-enumerated taxes on alcohol sales. For their income tax, right? And the actual prohibition of things is continuing to go on, but not necessarily when it comes to the sale of alcohol. Of course, the sale of alcohol is in fact prohibited still, unless you have the quote-unquote license or the approval, the authority to do it. So, no prohibition never ended. It's still going on. The prohibition is there. Are there prohibitions on things that they're not allowed to prohibit because they are criminal enemies? But in order for that to be fixed, there needs to be an enforcement of the original true law and a dealing with the usurpers and criminal enemy operatives currently operating in the country. So one of the interesting elements that is currently prohibited today is called saffron. According to Wikipedia, again, saffron is an organic compound with the formula blah, blah, blah. It is a colorless, oily liquid, although impure samples can appear yellow. A member of the blah, blah, blah family of natural products, it is found in sassafras plants. I believe that should be called sassafras trees. Okay. Among others, small amounts are found in a wide variety of plants where it functions as a natural antifeedant, os ocatea, blah, 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 which grows in Brazil, and I'm sure that has a different name, and sassafras albedum, which grows in eastern North America, are the main natural sources of saffron. It has a characteristic sweet shop aroma, whatever the hell that means. It is a precursor in the synthesis of the insecticide synergist, blah, blah, blah. So they use it as a precursor in the synthesis of an insecticide. That just means it's used prior to, or possibly has been replaced by, a different product, depending on whether or not the person actually knows what the word precursor means that's writing this article. But either way, it's used in synthesis of insecticide. Now, fluorine is also used in the manufacture of insecticide and is a very harmful chemical that is used in insecticide. And there's two different things going on. When you look up stuff about fluorine, it talks about how it is not detrimental, despite the fact that it is detrimental. So they spend all of this work trying to make you uh, understand that fluorine is safe and a nice chemical. In this context, however, they're saying that because of the saffron's use with insecticide, they're insinuating that it is a bad chemical because insecticides are bad. So they always play these little word games where it's good in one context and bad in another because it all has to do with their control of it and other things. Saffron is obtained from a number of plants, but especially from the sassafras tree. And there's that 
bogus Latin name. Latin's even a real language, or just a label for something that was uh, spoken by a common number of people and whatever for a different video, which is native North America and from the Japanese star anise. In 1844, the French chemist Edouard Saint Eve. 1817 to 1879, determined Saffron's empirical formula. Yeah, right. And there's an inscription and a name dropping. In 1869, the French chemist Edward Grimaud, interesting, they both are named Edward or Edouard, and J. Ruit, oh, what? Ruit? Root? Whatever. Investigated and named Saffron. They observed its reaction with bromine, suggested the presence of an allyl group. By 1884, the German chemist, Theodor Pollock, it's an interesting German name there, <laughs> suggested that saffron was a derivative of benzene, to which oxygen atoms were joined as epoxides. Saffron is the principal component of brown camphor oil, made from blah, 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 a plant growing in Brazil, and sassafras oil made from blah, blah, blah. In the U.S., commercially available culinary sassafras oil is usually devoid of saffron due to a rule passed by the U.S. FDA in 1960. So there you have an illegitimate prohibition by an illegitimate subsidiary of foreign interests. Detrimental, of course, to the people that live here with that prohibition. Saffron is not prohibited in Europe. No surprise there. Saffron can be attained through natural extraction from sassafras bottle. It's it's tree, right? Sassafras tree. They're inserting the stupid Latin word there. But again, this is probably written by a poor, I mean poor in the context of an individual in a sad state of affairs. Uh, you know, to be um, felt sorry for a student in the uh, bogus um, free labor extraction system that we call school. So sassafras oil, for example, is obtained by steam distillation of the root bark of the sassafras tree. The resulting steam distilled product contains about 90% saffron by weight. The oil is dried by mixing with a small amount of anhydrous calcium chloride. After filtering off the calcium chloride, the oil is vacuum distilled at blah, blah, blah. Saffron is typically extracted from the root bark or the fruit of the tree. Um, and again, it says native to Eastern North America, and that's more of the word games and labeling because uh, the sassafras tree grows in so many other parts of the world, and they just want to pretend like it originated here, just like that other idiot that I read in that one book that said that um, bees were not native to North America. Ha ha ha. So, yeah. Um, Saffron is also present in certain essential oils and in brown camphor oil, which is stated before, which is present in small amounts of many plants. Saffron can be found in anise, nutmeg, cinnamon, and black pepper. Saffron can be detected in undiluted liquid beverages and pharmaceutical preparations by high-performance liquid chromatography. So this is a chemical element that's prohibited from major sale, but is definitely going to be sold with uh, permission, as it were, so that they can control it, whereas it's not prohibited in Europe. So there's something going on there. And it specifically has to do with the current foreign rule of the United States doing so in usurpation of the U.S. Constitution. Now, the effects, despite all their prohibitions, have been damaging. And that's because their prohibitions have nothing to do with the pretend reason, which is, of course, removing the harmful effects of alcohol, as it said in that prohibition article. That's not what it's about at all. Hence, we have the so-called opioid epidemic, also referred to as the opioid crisis, is the rapid increase in the overuse, misuse, slash abuse, and overdose deaths attributed either in part or in whole to a class of drugs called opiates, opioids, since the 1990s. It includes the significant medical, social, psychological, demographic, and economic consequences of medical, non-medical, and recreational abuse of these medications. Now, it doesn't actually have to do with the recreational abuse as far as the what they just stipulated is the opioid epidemic, which is over involves involves overdose deaths. Deaths. Well, that also happens because they toxify and poison the water supply and the air and many other things. As I did in another video, when you have buildup of fluorine, you have a weaker system corporeally. Your your body is weaker, and thus cannot handle 
a lot of these damaging chemicals that are then introduced. And also you can have these things introduced introduced non-recreationally or uh, who knows what recreational actually means, but the way that they use it anyway to mean somebody who's taking it for reasons of, uh, for certain reasons, right? Uh, uh, recreationalism, as far as they determine it, has to do with your reasons for doing something. Well, a lot of people, considering the fact that it says overuse and overdose deaths, a lot of people have that happen to them, not because they're intentionally doing it, but because it's been done to them. Hence, you've got MK Ultra and just so many other things of that. Anyway, opioids are a diverse class of moderate to strong painkillers, including oxycodone, commonly sold under the trade names oxycontin Contin, and percocet, hydrocodone, or hydrocodone, Vicodin, Norco, and Fentanyl, which is a very strong painkiller that is synthesized to resemble other opiates such as opium derived morphine and heroin. The potency and availability of these substances, despite the potential risk of addiction and overdose, have been made popular both as medical treatments and as recreational drugs due to the sedative effects of opioids on the respiratory center of the medulla oblongata. Opioids in high doses present the potential for respiratory depression and may cause respiratory failure and death. Opioids are highly, highly effective for treating acute pain, but there is a strong debate over whether they are effective in treating a chronic or high-impact intractable pain as the risks may outweigh the benefits. Now, naturally, this is just like all these other articles written from one particular perspective. That's called censorship, right? And that's also control of information, just like they control markets, they control products, they control the sale of things. It is very important that we should read through this and understand that they're trying to present this in a certain way, or a sanitized way, as it were. But in actuality, this is a problem that is induced. When they prohibit something, and we know who they are, uh, as I, I listed who they are, basically, you know, all the phony governments that are operating based on foreign interests. When they prohibit something, they are not doing it because of the damaging effects, because we still have the damaging effects by all their prohibitions, and that's because they induce it, they cause it, and then they shift the liability or blame onto the regular people who had it done to them, right? When they prohibit something, it has entirely to do with controlling the market, controlling the ability to sell, buy and sell certain products, controlling people's behavior, making sure they have control over it and they can institute operations damage by their ability to acquire the chemical or the uh, object that nobody else can because they're the good guys, even though so often they have been found historically and in all patterns, basically, to not be the quote-unquote good guys, but to be the bad guys. To be the ones doing all of this nasty stuff. And yet, continuously, as we uh, referenced in the first part of this video, they, they are returned to by the majority of people, that no matter how many times they're outed as criminals, as liars, as enemies, as all this other stuff, no matter how many times, right? People always go back to them. Always go back to the universities uh, in large numbers, not everybody, of course, and uh, that number of sheeple, as some might call it, uh, constantly returning to the liars uh, is lessening today, thankfully. But either way, there's still a lot of people that continuously go back to the um, schools, right? Who roll their children in schools to be uh, extracted of free labor and all this other nonsense. Either way, what these people do with their prohibitions, that is another mechanism for market control. Now, with uh, this article on Wikipedia, Opium Production in Afghanistan, we should understand that all of the wars in Afghanistan revolved around the production of this particular substance, which leads, of course, to the opioid epidemic, considering opium and opioid those words apparently apparently anyway opioid is derived from opium as a word i don't know if that's true but either way we did have a lot of troops that were guarding poppy fields and before that you know the russians apparently were guarding poppy fields with the kgb and ca with their uh joint task force on protecting their uh creepy uh toxic trade to 
um, poison people across the globe. Afghanistan has long been, had a history of opium poppy cultivation and harvest. As of 2021, Afghanistan's harvest produces more than 90% of illicit heroin globally. What about illicit heroin? Not to mention, usually they only ever use the word illicit, but they don't use the word licit. Whereas they do use the word illegal, but also the word legal. So that's interesting that they don't use the word licit. And more than 95% of the European supply, more land is used for opium in Afghanistan than is used for cocoa cultivation in Latin America, the countries, blah, blah, blah. This is all just to be regurgitation of some crap from a textbook that was equally written by students, and then their labor was exploited, and some idiot brain-dead professor got their name put on it. <coughs> Next, of course, we have the CIA involvement in Contra cocaine trafficking. And like I said before, these people constantly get outed as liars and doing the opposite of what they claim, and yet they continue to claim what they're doing, and people continue to go back at them as the alleged official authorities. A number of writers have alleged that the United States Central Intelligence Agency, and there you've got your diminishing uh, phrase right there, a number of writers have alleged well, all of the other things were listed as absolute fact. But this one is all alleged. Mm -hmm. Was involved in the Nicaraguan Contras cocaine trafficking operations during the 1980s and Nicaraguan Civil War. These claims have led to investigations by the United States government, including hearings and reports by the United States House of Representatives, Senate Department of Justice, and the CIA's Office of the Inspector General, which ultimately concluded the allegations were unsupported. Yeah, no surprise there. This subject remains controversial. Pretty obvious what they're doing there in that paragraph. And naturally, this probably comes from a textbook and the uh, creepy free uh, labor and hostage, uh, child hostage uh, traffic, uh, legal tra human trafficking operation of the education system. Yeah, so this contrast thing is very well known to be somewhat at least a legitimate thing as far as the CIA is constantly involved in these schemes and all this other nonsense crap, just like they smuggled, uh, uh, you know, illicit drugs. <laughs> that, I guess, takes on a different meaning when they're doing it, right? Um, through the bodies of dead uh, soldiers and stuff from the Afghanistan and uh, also Vietnam and other places. Anyway, 1986 investigation by a subcommittee of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the Kerry Committee, I have no idea why they put that there. Found that the Contra drug links included, among other connections, payments to drug traffickers by the U.S. Department of Funds authorized by the Congress for humanitarian assistance to the Contras. In some cases, after the traffickers had been indicted by federal law enforcement agencies on drug charges, and other law traffickers were under active investigation by the same agency. It's such bogus uh, nonsense. Right? They're investigating the people that they're setting up to do this stuff. Pretty ridiculous. Just like with the uh, so-called unfounded Operation Fast and the Furious when it comes to weapons and pretty much everything else. You know, the illicit prohibition only is in regard to anyone not involved in their system. Anyone involved in their system, the their law does not apply to. Because, and of course, they have fake stories and scapegoats and other nonsense that they do, uh, all these different stories that they lie about and these fake fake news articles and things like that. But either way, the control is the operative key here. And this is from the perspective of foreign enemies. That's very important to understand. They, they uh, hate and despise anything legitimate across the globe, anything that is not controlled by them. They'll usurp, destroy, or rewrite uh, any laws that are contrary to theirs, as was listed in the Vatican canons. The charges of CIA involvement in Contra cocaine trafficking were revived in 1996 when a newspaper series by reporter Gary Webb in the San Jose Mercury News claimed that the trafficking had played an important role in the creation of the crack cocaine drug problem in the United States. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> revived. The charges were revived. Yeah, right. So these are charges not made by them, and thus they don't have any foundation because they're the only ones that hold themselves accountable, and they're never going to do that because they, uh, yeah, you know. Web series led to three federal investigations, all of which concluded there was no evidence of a conspiracy by CIA officials or employees to bring drugs in the United States. Naturally. They uh, found no evidence. 
Yeah, right. Well, it says it led to three federal investigations. Well, they're investigating themselves. It's it's quite stupid to imagine that somebody... But either way, this stuff is, is true. It's been proven many times different ways, and we see the impact of it today. And naturally, they will always try to leverage blame onto the victims of their operations because they're enemies, right? That's what enemies do, you know? They're going to blame you for what they're doing to you because they are your enemy. You're in a war. And in a real war, there aren't any uh, arbitrary rules. There are practical rules, which is to win. However, an internal report issued by the CIA would admit that the agency was at least aware of contra involvement in drug trafficking and in some cases dissuaded the DEA and other agencies from investigating the contra supply networks involved. Of course, this article, just like all the other ones, only comes from one perspective, and that's the enemy perspective. So imagine, if you will, if you today, as a U.S. citizen, following the Constitution, even the revised one, were to set up your own exchange house. Well, I'm sure a lot today, now more than ever, would know exactly what kind of tactics and strategies would be leveraged against them to shut them down. And the reason why they would be shut down, and the only reason, would because they would be what they're, they're doing so independently of criminal nonsense, right? So you set up an exchange house, and you decide not to pay taxes in the exchange house. These taxes, which are criminal and contrary to the Constitution, should not be paid anyway. But you do this with an exchange house, right? You set up an exchange house. It could be like private residence. It doesn't matter, whatever it is. Well, that's instantly going to be labeled a black market. Then you're going to have, you know, so-called code enforcement and people coming and saying, it's not zoned for what you're doing. You're going to have police that try to come and shut down, so you'd have to fight them. Right on behalf of foreign interests and things contrary to the law, crimes. The police will be enforcing the crimes, right? So that's pretty weird. You also have attorneys that will show up with summons and different letters and things telling you not to do this. But you will definitely have undercovers go in and subvert it by trying to sell, quote-unquote, illicit products you know, engage in prostitution or try to sell other things. So you can have a private house, right, where you prohibit all this stuff, and it doesn't matter. They're going to uh, infiltrate it with different people and try to set up a sting operation by creating the very crime that they'll charge you with, right? And you'll also have people in specifically church groups who will go around and spread rumors about all kinds of nonsense. So they have all of these tactics that they use to shut down anything legitimate. And they have a lot of mental programming and training behind this particular issue. All that stuff has to be removed. Otherwise, they're just going to continue doing da as much damage as they can do by controlling these things that they have no legitimate control over as an enemy outfit. For an enemy outfit. An example of this, apparently, can be found with the Silk Road Marketplace. Silk Road was an online black market. Right, there's your label. The first modern dark net market. There's another label. It was launched in 2011 by its American founder, Ross Ulbricht allegedly, under the pseudonym Dread Pirate Roberts. Now, there's a lot of people that believe there are multiple Dread Pirate Roberts, and this person is probably a fake fall guy that they invented to dissuade people, when in fact they never actually got anyone. As part of the dark web, Silk Road operated as a hidden service in the Tor network, allowing users to buy and sell products and services between each other anonymously. All transactions were conducted with Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency which aided in protecting user identities. And that's not true, by the way. You have barter. The website was known for its illegal drug marketplace, of course, among other illegal and legal product listings. Between February 2011 and July 2013, the site facilitated sales amounting to blah, 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 Bitcoin. And naturally, uh, you'll find out if you do much research into this, that most of those uh, illegal drug uh, marketplace um, product listings were done by undercover FBI agents. So go figure. They created this very issue that they uh, used as the crime to shut it down. In October 2013, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, FBI, shut down the Silk Road website and arrested Ulbricht. 
even though that probably wasn't the person who was actually running it, if that person even existed. Silk Road 2.0 came online the next month, run by other administrators of the former site, but was shut down the following year as part of Operation Anonymous, and that's spelled with an O. Onimus, I suppose. Well, it would be anonymous, it would be Onimus. Really weird. 2015, Ulbricht was convicted in federal court for multiple charges related to Operation Silk Road and was given two life sentences without possibility of parole, and that sounds like the same bogus thing that they did with a character known as Al Capone. So they uh, recycled the same tactic there. Uh, and the real thing that they did was they couldn't get anyone, apparently, with their bogus listings, so they just went ahead and shut down the IP address because it has absolutely nothing to do with actually stopping damaging crimes. That's the very important thing. They like damage to people's health across the board. They like damage and undermining of the defense of the nation of the people, right, the, the real human people, not their fake dreaded entities, right? I'm not taught, using coded language here. They like the damage of the opioid epidemic, as they call it. They like all of this stuff. When they take something down, it is entirely and only has to do with their control and ability to extract revenue or equity. And that's it. It has nothing to do with actually protecting people. That's the reason why you will have police Gestapo kicking down doors and killing people over selling eggs at a lower price. Next, of course, in this uh, history of their nonsense, you have the FTX trading LTD. LTD is limited and generally used uh, in the Europe or the United Kingdom versus the LLC as used in the United States. Although nowadays we have a lot of limiteds incorporated in the United States, which, boy, that's confusing. Commonly known as FTX, short for Futures Exchange, is a bankrupt company that formerly operated a fraud-ridden cryptocurrency exchange and crypto hedge fund. The exchange was founded in 2019 by Sam Bankman-Fried and Gary Wang. At its peak in July 2021, the company had over 1 million users and was the third largest crypto exchange by volume as of November 2020. And I'm not going to read the rest of this because it is all just basically regurgitation of useless textbook nonsense. Next, we have a Corn 2009 undercover videos controversy. Yeah, it's a controversy. <laughs> 2009, workers at offices of the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, ACORN, a collection of autonomous community-based organizations that advocated for low- and moderate-income families were secretly recorded by conservative activists Hannah Giles and James O'Keefe. The video is purported to show low-level ACORN employees in several cities providing advice to Giles and O'Keefe on how to avoid taxes and detection by the authorities with regard to their plans to engage in tax evasion, human smuggling, and child prostitution. Yeah, of course, their big one there is tax evasion, and the least, most, least important of that is child prostitution. Big one they care about and will always care about is the evasion of their phony criminal taxes and also their criminal and phony regulations and control structures. The video was published on Andrew Breitbart's website, Big Government, from September through November 2009. They generated extensive negative publicity for ACORN and led to the United States Census Bureau and the IRS ending their contracts with ACORN. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. So this is all going to be a bunch of nonsense um, about how they're uh, not culpable and you know, them, of course, being the agents of the enemy corporation, pretend to be government. Also, Acorn is the name of a other company which engages in the phony uh, scams as far as stocks go and, and phony investments. Now, it's hard to look up, but there's also a similar pattern of this type of rampant fraud schemes, uh, uh, extraction of revenue, and in entities not being actually held accountable for their real crimes, but rather being shut down, changing names, and then continuing to do what they've been doing before. You know, the E-Trade platform. Uh, a lot of religious organizations were behind legitimizing that fraudulent scam, which was later found out to be so, but... Um, since subsequently the internet has been censored of that information along with many others thanks to i guess the ministry of truth <laughs> you want to call it that but really it's just a bunch of criminals doing the criminal things that they've been doing the entire time so naturally all this stuff has to uh go against the u.s constitution as usual weird states to coin money regulate the value thereof and foreign coin and fix the standard weights and measures that is Congress's job, a legitimate Congress. 
Unfortunately, that is not their job today because their job is not being done. The Constitution is not being upheld, it's not being followed, and it's basically being ignored across the board, even by those that swore allegiance to it. Of course, the Constitution itself was revised and edited by criminal elements in the Jesuit and Vatican power structure order. And this section specifically is very important because what they're doing right now, it all comes down to standard of weights and measures, the ability to coin um, the value of money, and naturally uh, exchange would have a lot to do with that as well. Of course, the entity today that does that job is ISO, or the International Organization for Standardization. According to Wikipedia, the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, is an independent, non-governmental, international standard development organization composed of representatives from national standards organizations of member countries, blah, 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 more of the uh, UN crap. ISO was founded in 23 February 1947. Well, that's an interesting date. And as of January 2024, it has published over 2,000... 25,000 international standards covering almost all aspects of technology and manufacturing. It has over 800 technical committees, TCs and subcommittees, SCs to take care of standards development. Naturally, just like all these juridic structures, they don't recognize the input of natural humans. Everything is what's done by organizations or groups because the identity of singular individuals is not considered by these criminal enterprises. The organization develops and publishes international standards for easiness, or easiness, that's a weird word, easiness, on end user or com commoner's market. Right, there you go, market manipulation. Like availability in technical and non-technical fields, including everything from manufactured products and technology to food safety, transport, IT, agriculture, and healthcare. This is the entity that the FDA gets the directives from, along with the FBI and any other outfit or organization, your subcommittees, your small groups and inside municipalities, every single entity throughout the country or possibly even throughout the globe that gets any directives on their phony regulations of uh, local markets and things like that, they get their directives from this entity, not from the legitimate, thus making them agents of an enemy operation to usurp and supplant the true law. Of course, this has been going on a very long time and thus is a very difficult issue to deal with. So naturally, the Wikipedia article about this concept doesn't really talk about the U.S. Constitution standards of weights and measures, but in fact talks about things under its declared labels and regurgitation of bogus textbooks. The imperial and U.S. customary measurement systems are both derived from an earlier English system of measurement, which in turn can be traced back to ancient Roman units of measurement and Carolingian and Saxon units of measurement can be. Of course, they will trace it back there. But here it states can be. Of course, it can be traced to many other things, too, including the uh, trade of uh, U.S. Indian nations, which they're going to ignore that one, because they don't like to uh, look at any of the impacts made by individuals, and those, of course, individuals will come from nations that they deem to be uh, well, many things, but they absolutely despise Indians, among other groups. The U.S. customary system of units was developed and used in the United States after the American Revolution based on a subset of the English units used in the 13 colonies. It is the predominant system of units in the United States and in U.S. territories except Puerto Rico and Guam, where the metric system is also officially used and is predominant, which was introduced in both territories were Spanish colonies. No, the metric system was not introduced then because the metric system was not around then. That is a newer introduction, and they have designs on enforcing that subversively through the education system into the United States. In mo most cases, you have the metric system being applied and eventually will uh, subsume or take over the role of the current system, and thus you have the International Standardizations Organization imposing the metric system across the globe and removing anything else that does not facilitate international control. The imperial system of units was developed and used in the United Kingdom and its empire beginning in 1826. The metric system has to varying degrees replaced the imperial system in countries that once used it. Yeah, no crap. It's replaced everything. Um, it's difficult to replace the United States because the people cling to outdated and primitive forms, according to them. Now, it states in one part 
reference to the Declaration of Independence, states after the United States Declaration of Independence, the units of measurement in the United States develop into what is now known as customary units. So they put the label customary units on the apparent legitimate, but they probably mix in illegitimate, that's some one of their tactics with their customary units label. Customary, of course, meaning according to custom, what is done in practice, not what is done in law. So that's the diminishing label they put on it, where in fact, uh, whatever was done after the War of Independence up until the 1860s when the Constitution was usurped by a foreign control, divide and conquer, that's what the Civil War is about. Well, that would have been legitimate law, but they would put it under customary units, and from then on, it would be labeled as customary units. Just what's done in practice, not what's done in the United Kingdom overhauled the system of measurement in 1826 when it introduced the imperial system of units. This resulted in the two countries having different gallons. Later in this century, efforts were made to align the definition of the pound and the yard in two countries by using copies of standards adopted by British Parliament in 1855. And there you have obvious uh, evidence of overt reimposition of uh, British imperial control, and even though it was clandestinely done. And to some degree. However, these standards were of poor quality compared with those produced by the Convention of the Meter. And that's, of course, where you get the metric, the International Convention. Hmm. Sounds about right. 1960, the two countries agreed to common definitions over the yard and the pound based on definitions in the meter and the kilogram. In 1960, the two countries agreed. There's more of your non recognition of individuals and only of juridical entities going on there and naturally that is uh, treason it's usurpation of the constitution in which congress sends standards of weights and measures they do not agree to standards of weights and measures based off of uh, cohesion with foreign it's just stuff's crap this change which mounted to a few parts per million had a little effect in the united kingdom but resulted in the united states having a slightly different system of linear measure, blah, 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 and of course, eventually they do plan on imposing the metric system in the United States. First, through uh, subversion in the education system to train people, their little foot soldiers, to go out and then enforce it uh, through yelling, through uh, stubborn co coherence or, or stubborn um, collusion, right? All, all the people in the education system, they're trained through various psychological programs, to become willing or not not willing but um, ignorant minions who will then go out and force everybody else to comply simply based off of the requirement to address that person's ignorant standpoint where you have to in order to communicate with that person communicate with them on their level and thus you get sucked into the uh, quagmire of nonsense that they teach in those criminal systems. Now, of course, they don't want anybody to know about what things were like before because they will make a stark contrast to their disgusting, uh, creepy structure that they have today where you're trained to follow along like, um, you know, simple sheep. So they have to uh, remove examples of that from history, but they can't remove everything. And so there are um, shadows of the past that remain, things that reflect uh, or that give an idea of what life used to be like under less uh, illegitimate usurpation and control. The exchange houses today uh, is a place where you go and exchange phony currency for other phony currency and then you pay a fee to them to just change digits or just print out different forms of paper and that fee is usually extortive, extort, extortative. I'm not sure if that's the right word there. But either way, you pay them uh, to run the same scheme that the entity known as Jesus had an issue with in the Bible, even though Jesus is just French for Swee and his real name was eliminated so that you can't uh, track through old texts and things like that. But either way, this uh, 
had these house of thieves uh, run an exchange system that is so far beyond what an actual exchange would be, which would be simply the exchange of products, such as if you had like coffee beans that you made, you would go and maybe exchange it for some eggs, some flour, some milk, some things like that, right? You, you would use that as a currency in what nowadays would be mentioned as barter, even though barter is not exchange, that's a... Um, that's a, a misappropriation or misassociation uh, of words where bartering is the same as haggling. It is simply the process to which you uh, debate over uh, the value of things, which you don't have to do when the standards of weights and measures are set by a legitimate entity, right? Otherwise, you have bartering when you don't have a standard of weights and measures. When you have a standard of weights and measures, all you have to do is go and exchange things because the standard of value has already been set. It's much easier, and that's what exchange houses used to be. But now the exchange refers to bogus currency exchange. Some examples of the historical exchange can be found in old structures, such as you have the cotton exchange in North Carolina, and you have the uh, exchange in Charleston, South Carolina, and many other places have uh, different exchanges which now have shops in them where people pay these uh, criminal income taxes in order to, and get licenses and are allowed to work here. All these places are controlled when in fact in the past they would have been simple exchanges where people were free to go and trade items under a set value of structures, right? A, a public market, if you will. Naturally, we have market streets throughout the United States, various streets named Market Street, in which you have basically the same idea as those exchanges where they're basically just shops everywhere and all these shops are licensed and they pay their income tax and all this other nonsense. Otherwise, they get shut down. And these streets are instead of the original form where it was a place where you could go and trade and bring your stuff free from any arbitrary or um, any illegitimate controls anyway. Well, nowadays, they're all just basically shops, and you don't have anything in the United States anyway as uh, street vendors, right? You have very few of those. I mean, you have you do have like taco stands and stuff. But that's nowhere near the scale of what it originally was, and the fact that we have ubiquitously so many different streets named Market, and we have so many exchanges, it tells you about what exactly life was like back then. Now, in the cities, we still have squares, square center cities, which have, um, which speak to a different time when people would actually gather in the public square to do different things and stuff like that, and they were free to assemble there. However, nowadays, all of those have become private property of corporate interests, which always lead back essentially to Europe, the Vatican, Switzerland, etc. Now, in the Levantine Adventure of the Travels and Missions of Chevalier Darvoux, 1653 to 1697 by Warren H. Lewis, we also get a description of what things were like in the past century when it comes to less controlled markets and what nowadays would be ter termed black markets. On page 92, it states, As a rule, Darvoux was too independent to indulge in caravan travel. And in fact, I can recall only one other occasion on which he made a journey with one. But for, more, for most tourists and merchants, the caravan was the normal method of getting about the Ottoman Empire and beyond it into Persia and India. Centuries of experience had standardized this vital link, which throughout the East was the equivalent of the world shipping routes of today rather than of its railways. Sea transport and merchandise did not come into its own until the end of the century, though as early as 1671 Arab Sloth and Turkish extortion had begun to force the Far Eastern and Persian traffic off the caravan routes and onto the oceans. Yeah, that sounds about right. They want to remove this method, and so that's what they were doing at that time. And uh, so far today, it appears to have worked, considering the cons, as this uh, book mentioned, uh, became um, ill-used. And the design of cons we can still find today, but the practical application of the con design is not done, where you have like a square building and the center is open, and that's specifically for bringing in horses and stuff like that. And you have the con design in many places, but people don't travel on horses, so there's no practical reason to keep that. It's just to carry over from custom, right? 
The caravanner, unlike his descendant, who buys a steamship ticket today, did not travel at an inclusive rate. All that the master of the caravan provided was armed protection in a camping site or caravanserai every night. Everything else the traveler had to provide for himself, though I think an all-in service was given by the organizers of the Easter pilgrimage caravans from the coast to Jerusalem. One traveler tells us that for a caravan journey, sleeping mats, biscuit, wine, oil, vinegar, salt, and candles must be taken, and that this means a baggage mule for yourself and your servant. Another advises a mattress and says that one can always rely on the villages en route for straw, wood, and bread. But he adds, never join a caravan without an emergency supply of rice. Sometimes, but normally only on a desert route, drinking water had to be carried, and though no one mentions it, I fancy one would have needed a large assortment of clothing, especially on the long-distance routes where a caravan might be three months or more on the road in all varieties of climate. Thamino, in the fast Suez Cairo convoy, which averaged three miles an hour, traveled in a burning wind so strong that he had to turn his back to it to breathe, and his drinking water got so hot that he could not swallow any until after sunset. Even so, he was not traveling in the hot weather when the hamshin was blowing and when daily deaths in a caravan were a commonplace of travel. By contrast, Lucas traveling in the Anatolian highlands marched for 14 hours through the mountains in a continuous snowstorm, and a few days later his caravan sailed out at daybreak in a cold that cut the face. Climate conditions apart, a man needed to be in the pink of condition to travel with a caravan, for the days were long and full of difficulties. Tonge, traveling with the Aleppo caravan in 1676 and disliking it very much, complained of marches that began at 2 in the morning, or marches that began at 2 in the morning, and went on until 5 in the evening. The least uncomfortable caravan journey of which I can find any record is that which Theveno made from Cairo to Jerusalem in 1658, when he was able to alternate between riding a donkey and traveling in a camel pannier. But it was more regimented than those on other routes. A military camp was established every night, and no one was allowed to leave camp after the sentries had been posted. The most famous and picturesque caravan in the east was that called the Descent of the Vest of Mohammed which once a year traveled from Cairo to Mecca, bearing the sultan's offerings for the tomb of the prophet. But of course, it was out of the question for a Christian to travel in it. If one was caught even in the neighborhood of Mecca, he was at once burnt alive. Not indeed would he have enjoyed the trip, even had he been allowed to make it. During the 45-day journey of the descent in 1657, there were 6,000 deaths, and those who returned alive were so changed that it was difficult to recognize them. But as its departure from Cairo must have been a brave sight, with its 8,000 camels, its escort, a small army, and the mounted drummers and cymbal players to rejoice the camels who take great pleasure both in this noise and in the sound of singing. And for man and beast to survive the ordeal, there were great rewards. The man could ever after wear the coveted green turban and be saluted with the deference due to a haji. Whilst the camel had a triangle of green cloth sewn to its brown band, brow band, and thereafter lived in idleness to the end of his days. Darvu's journey was uneventful, and at six o'clock in the morning of the third day, he arrived at Seed, extremely tired and intending to sleep for the rest of the day, but he had reckoned without the exasperating politeness of his friends. Unfortunately, my return became known, and I had to receive the condolences of the whole nation on the death of my mother. I was not at liberty until six in the evening, and then I was in such a state that I could not sleep, but spent the night in composing statements to send to Marseille. Or Marseille. This was to be the end of his traveling for a considerable time. I lived in Seed for the next four years, where business put me in the way of recovering the losses my family had made. Now, that section gives us an understanding, or at least an example, of an explanation, uh, a practical explanation, not this garbage that we, crap that we get online nowadays, of uh, caravan travel. On a different page, it states, in addition to being the toughest, Darvu was the least credulous of contemporary travelers. 
At Jaffa, he was told that he was in town in which the Ark was built, a statement which he remarks dryly. It was difficult to believe, seeing that at Cadiz, you can see the actual shipyard from which it was launched. And thus, we get a reference to the age-old swindle that's still going on today and continues to go on in most parts of the world, and that is the uh, fraud of a selling a fantasy. That's what most churches are about, of course. And so it was alive, as alive then as, as it is today, except I think in a different aspect, as far as the war for independence with the United States, you had a period of legitimacy where such a thing was either uh, dealt with or it was um, deterred from being done, the, the idea of a swindle. But either way, the selling of a fantasy is something that isn't real. The people who are otherwise ignorant, that is, in fact, fraud. Even though it's not called much and it's sort of winked at most of the time. So naturally, we have the idea uh, when it comes to these uh, fraudsters and um, enemies who employ these tactics to control things that they have no legitimacy around. The bait and switch is a primary tactic in which they will offer something and then switch it with something else. After you've signed the contract, of course, they don't follow any sorts of regulations, ceremonial, customary, or otherwise. In fact, uh, all of that stuff entirely has to do with one-sided enforcement, getting somebody else to do it, whereas they don't. And that's the same thing with um, these prohibitions, right? They prohibit something in the bait and switch scheme and then they, in fact, induce a large quantity of those prohibitions, uh, of those uh, objects that are prohibited, right? We have, a, despite prohibitions on alcohol, we have a heavy level of drunkenness, right? That's promoted. Despite prohibitions on prostitution, we have a lot of that. We have a lot of uh, so-called uh, illegal or unwritten illicit drug use or whatever, all these different words they use, uh, despite all the prohibitions on those. That's, of course, naturally part of the concept of bait and switch, which they say we're gonna, they're going to do one thing, and then they do it, but then they switch it out with something else, and so on and so forth. So that's a primary fraud tactic that is used by these people. Now, the markets in South America, some point to and say, well, those are free markets, right? They're, um, they're, they're uh, you can go there and barter. Well, no, I've been there. No, you can't. You have to go there and use the same currency as everyone else, and all of them also pay illegitimate fraudulent taxes to these foreign corporate entities in order to function. They have the appearance of being the exchanges of yesteryear, but they're not. And so they are carryover from, from old times in which things were freer, but they are just as equally controlled as everything else is. All the markets are controlled by these people, and any that aren't get shut down. What's interesting, of course, is that a lot of these markets in South America might be called black markets, when in fact they don't fit that bogus definition of black market that we looked at before, except for maybe the sale of quote-unquote illicit products. Otherwise, they pay their fake taxes and all that. Now, some people also point to, say, farmer's markets and say, oh, well, they can come out here and they can sell their wares and do all that stuff. Uh, well, you can't do any bartering, you can't do any trade, and they also pay a very extortionate control mechanisms. And in some cases, they have these, as I've proved through evidence and things like that, they have extortionary agreements that they make in which they indemnify and pay for the protection and defense of the individuals running the market so that if they have the problem, they are in fact paying with their proceeds and revenue and whatnot, uh, those people to uh, have defense against them and so many other things. It's a uh, it's, it's really not anything like we used to have, but it is a carryover in custom anyway from the past. However, unfortunately, like I said, all of these things are controlled. All these mechanisms are controlled. Any past carryover is begrudgingly done with the designs of being done away with eventually in the future because they want absolute and complete unquestionable control and they want to erase any traces of the past so that those things can never be resurrected again as according to the canon of the Vatican.